We have, next coming up, two brilliant keynote speakers this morning. And our first speaker is actually a former chairperson of SNAKE, adjunct professor Muriel Bamblett. Muriel Bamblett is a Yorta Yorta and Jarjarung woman who has been employed as Chief Executive Officer of the Victorian Aboriginal Child Care Agency since 1999. Muriel was the chairperson of SNAKE for 10 years and was awarded a lifetime associate membership of SNAKE as well. And I wanted to just say briefly while I'm here, I want to acknowledge another lifetime associate member of SNAKE that's with us this morning, um, Brian Butler. Knowledge that he's here with us. Thank you, Brian. So Muriel, getting back to Muriel. Muriel is active on many boards and committees concerning children, families, and the, and the Aboriginal community. These include uh, the Victorian Children's Council, Aboriginal Children's Forum, the Aboriginal Treaty Working Group, the Indigenous Family Violence Partnership Forum, and the Aboriginal Justice Forum. And she contributes very, very well in those forums, I can tell you. Muriel has been the recipient of, many, a number of, of a number of awards, including the Centenary of Federation Medal, the 2003 Robin Clark Memorial Award for inspirational leadership in the field of child and family welfare, and in 2011 was inducted into the 2011 Victorian Honour Roll of Women and was a finalist for a Human Rights Medal with the Australian Human Rights Commission. Muriel was also awarded a member of the Order of Australia in 2004 Australian Day Honours for her services to the community, particularly through leadership in pro the provision of services for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children and families. In 2009, she was appointed by La Trobe University as an adjunct professor in the School of Social Work and Social Policy within the Faculty of Health Sciences. Muriel was recently awarded, April 2017, a Doctor of Letters in Social Work for Leadership in Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Welfare and Affairs by the University of Sydney. I would like you to all put your hands together and welcome one of our snake legends, Adjunct Professor Muriel Bamblett. Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, to all those dancers last night, um, I had the best time. For those that didn't go, um, you missed a really great night. Um, can I begin too big by acknowledging, acknowledging the Ngunnawal people um, and pay my respects to their elders past and present? Um, it makes me so proud um, to see the ceremony which opens Parliament House these days. Isn't it amazing to it that they acknowledge us as the First Peoples? There are many people here from many lands across Australia. There are many people who contribute so much to Aboriginal affairs and who give so much. I just want to acknowledge all of you and your contribution. I want to pay my respects to your mobs, to your elders, to your ancestors. I want to especially thank um, Aunty Matilda Walthouse, who last night talked about how many times she's given welcome and, and acknowledged Snake. But I really want to acknowledge um, Something she said to me many years ago, she, I was chair at Snake at the time and she'd come to do an opening. And we were having a forum between the Aboriginal, National Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Legal Service, NACHO, the National Aboriginal Community Controlled Health and Snake. What they wanted to do was look at how we work together. But one of the things that only Matilda said to us at that forum, you come to our land, respect our land and observe our protocols. And now we were all Aboriginal people in that room, so it wasn't about us not behaving ourselves, but it was about respect. And I think that's one of the things that I constantly remembered whenever I see her. It's about respect, respect for each other and respect for land. And I was, every time I see her, I remember that message. So for us today, um, I just wanted to as well acknowledge Brian Butler, um, who's made a, a big effort to get here. Um, I was to follow in his footsteps um, and I said to someone, he'd been chair for 10 years and I was so nervous going into that position because I said, how am I going to fill the shoes of this, this amazing man? And someone said, you just grow into him inch by inch. And um, amazingly, Brian, um, you were an amazing chair and, amaz and you contributed so much to our community. <laughs> well, 
well due. Um, we've celebrated many anniversaries, um, the 50th anniversary of the 67 referendum, um, the 20th anniversary of the Bringing Them Home report, we've talked a lot about that, the 25th anniversary of the Marbo decision by the High Court, which overturned the legal fiction of terra nullius in this country. And from my perspective, the 40th anniversary of the Victorian Aboriginal Child Care Agency, um, which I believe was of national significance because it was what the model that was, fault, that was um, to be duplicated across our country. Snake conferences to, um, now are great events. I attended my first conference in 1997. It was to be my first um, experience of snake. It was an amazing time. It was when Mick Dodson first launched the, the findings from his, the bringing them home. The keynote speaker then was Mick. He delivered one of the most powerful and explosive speeches, and again, he did it this year. He then very clearly stated what the actions we needed to undertake and what we needed to address. Unfortunately, we didn't listen. Well, the government didn't listen. But before I give my fault, my formal presentation, I also want to pay my respects to some of those elders of Snake who without them, we wouldn't be here today. I've already mentioned Brian Butler. There are some that are not here, some is spirit that live on in many of us. To Eric Kyle, Heather Shearer, Jenny Pryor, Margaret Arkey, Margaret, Mar Barbara Cummings, the late Isabel Coe, my late husband, Alf Bamblett, Jenny Munro, Lois Farley, Rachel Quilret from Tasmania, to Peter Haroa, who we lost too young, who was an amazing man, to Dale McLeod, the late Anibal Weldon from Wagga, the late Patrick Rowe from Derby, Marge Thorpe, Annie Molly Dyer. There are many who too that I haven't mentioned, but I must name, must acknowledge them because it's important. We're still going, Snake, after 36 years, and the group is still going strong and I acknowledge them. So my presentation today, I really do want to make some key points. Um, we know that um, 20 years on, so I wanted to gauge 20 years on from the Bringing Them Home report when that was launched. And I know that there's already been much discussion and I know that many would say there has been little action. I know that there are people every day, however, and some are in this room and some, many across our nation who are very hard, working very hard to address both the, all of the issues around health, well-being and safety, particularly of our children. The presence of culture is now better understood, I believe, and a comp key component of our children's well-being. And we've heard so much already from this conference. The numbers of our children in care across the nation now is greater than ever, and it's a great issue of concern for all of us. Geraldine spoke about the Snake Family Matters campaign and it is attempting to focus government and community attention on it and the, reducing that and uh, over-representation. And I do believe we are making headway in getting governments to refocus their attention on this matter. One thing I do know about this field in child and family welfare is that we have always been advocates on a number of level, levels. Whether this be lobbying governments and policy makers, as I do in my role most of the time, to change legislation, policy and practice, whether it is as an individual child protection worker when we advocate for the needs of our children or whether we represent more broadly our Aboriginal community. We always come to the table hopeful that government will listen to us and that things will change. After all these years, I am now more steadfast in my view than ever that best interests of our children and their well-being and safety is to be with their families and communities. Surely the fact that 80% of our children and their f are living in their families, being raised by the group and are doing very well, attest to this very, very significant issue. We know strong families, strong culture, raises strong children. We have to, though, today think about those children who are not doing so well. The figures published in the Bringing Them Home report were at that time we thought very high, and indeed they were and certainly are concerning about the overrepresentation of our children, particularly back then. But compare that with the situation today. These are 
extraordinary figures and they starkly um, highlight the crisis we face today. Now you know why Snape is taking this up. 20 years on and still, it's getting worse. We have to address this situation. Have a look at those. Since the bringing them home, a 596% increase. That's amazing. That's um, a terrible statistic and nothing to be proud of. We know that there were 54 recommendations. Now, that's not a lot of recommendation. Mick Dotson spoke yesterday of the inaction of the Keating government in actioning the recommendation of, social, of a social justice package. Recommendation 42 of the Bringing Them Home report concerned addressing underlying issues. Recommendation 43 of the Bringing Them Home called for governments to negotiate with us and our representative bodies. They called for national legislation. When I first came to SNAPE, that was the big push, national legislation, we need less, particularly as it relates to Aboriginal child placement principle. Though obviously, um, our national legislation would establish a framework for negotiations at a community and regional level for the implementation of self-determination in relation to the well-being of our children and young people. This recommendation all call, also called for negotiations about the transfer of legal jurisdiction in relation to children's welfare, care and protection, the transfer of policing, judicial and departmental functions, uh, that there be a development of a relationship changed on the pre on, and premised on self-determination principles and that appropriate funding and other resources or programs go with that. Now you imagine what position would we be in, would, that we would be in today if we had actioned all these recommendations and those contained in other inquiries. So in moving forward, I want to talk for a minute and remember Ani Molly Dyer. This year we celebrate our 40th anniversary and our, and our founder, Ani Molly Dyer, sadly to, went too soon. It is important that we honour and reflect on those who have contributed so much. It's important we remember and honour our heroes, our people that give to us, our people that continue to fight and our people that continue to give. It's too easy to shoot us down and to diminish us, but we need to create our own heroes in our own communities. Back at today, um, there's no comparison to the backer of the 70s. So I wanted to just give you a bit of an, we are growing, we are doing things, we are making a difference. In the 70s, 80s and 90s, um, things have changed. But I need to, we, we always give thanks to our elders, to our strong leaders, to those of, of the past and who in previous eras have lobbied and advocated strongly for the change. Without them, I wouldn't be here and our organisation would be, wouldn't be here. Our purpose remains large, largely unchanged from the VACA that was established in 1977. That is to strengthen the safety, the wellbeing and the cultural connectedness of Aboriginal children, individual and families in their community. VACA turns 40 this year and the last 20 years from 1996, the organisation has grown dramatically from small beginnings when we operated a handful of foster care and family support programs. We have one typewriter in the organisation. One typewriter, you can't even use a typewriter nowadays. Um, the C I, was, I, as the CEO, managed 34 staff and the organisation really operated in survival mode. We were at the ambulance chasers at the bottom of the cliff catching families. We now operate a number of programs across the, uh, the state, 45 diverse programs, including family violence, homelessness support, child protection, stolen generations, reunification, out of home care, emergency relief. We run a women and children's refuge, cultural activities, art mentoring. Advocacy has always played a central role in our operation. Our staff complement is now 400 plus and forecast to grow as Victoria's commitment to self-determination is realised. Aboriginal staff numbers are approximately 51% of our workforce. This is our key challenge. Where are we going to get Aboriginal staff to grow self-determination? If we are going to grow self-determination, we need to invest in our workforce. Today's achievements could not have been attained without the investment and innovation in our back of house services. This commenced properly in 2010 through the wisdom and foresight of, the, of our VACA board, a number of who are here today, who show a genuine interest in our growth. 
Rapid growth has all, also meant revising our organisational structure and management several, on, on several occasions and investing it. You need to invest in infrastructure when you run an Aboriginal organisation. We need to make sure that our organisations are robust and strong. We have con a continued process, uh, improvement process, training, planning, investing in back of house, funding, technology, all of those things necessary to run a good service. So what are the programs that we run? This is a list of our programs. You will see that most of our services are at the care end of, our, of the, the out of home care spectrum. Although we do have services such as the Likijik Access Service, which is an advisory service to um, the Department of Human Services. Um, and it is through that that we provide services to every Aboriginal child in Victoria at the centre of a notification. So when there's a notification for an Aboriginal child, they must be to an Aboriginal organisation, whether it be VACA or the MADAS, which is Mildura Aboriginal Service, Mallet District Aboriginal Service, sorry. I keep old days in Mildura, but anyway. Um, we also have, uh, we run statewide programs such as permanent care and stop link up. But I just want to mention as well, we also have um, ab Aboriginal staff. Now we have Aboriginal staff as HR consultants, and we have Aboriginal fleet managers, Aboriginal IT. We don't, we're not just an organisation that delivers wealth, that has welfare services. We are actually, um, have a number of staff back of house. So Victoria is home to a number of Aboriginal families. So we're not the only child welfare service in Victoria. There are a number of Aboriginal services delivering. So you can see from this diagram where the Aboriginal services are. So each of these services deliver local child and family welfare services. So they deliver out of home care, family support, housing, homelessness, education, early years programs. These are what we call community hubs. They are based on localism. They are based on delivering services to local people in local communities. They fight for justice every day for their community. They represent family violence, education and outcomes on a local level. Um, I just want to acknowledge our Aboriginal services that are in the room as well. Um, many people ask me um, why with all these services and increased funding, why are our children more likely to end up in care? And I've put some of those factors up there and we know that. We know that 88% of Aboriginal children come into care for family violence, drug and alcohol, health and mental health issues, housing and homelessness, income support. And why, after all these years, have we done little to address these issues? Why have we not made inroads a generation on since all the inquiries were held? But to me, some of the th things that we're unable to address is really generational po poverty. We have, ex in this country, um, inherited the poverty. We were rich, but now we're poor. We're paupers. Many of our people are paupers on their own land. So we have poverty not only of money, poverty of culture, poverty of re relationships, land, spirituality, and, and very sadly, po poverty of spirit. Um, I just really, after that very sad statement, um, I did want to talk some of, about a couple of inquiries that we've had in Victoria. Um, and we've had two inquiries ourselves. I think everybody's had so many inquiries. But we had what we call Victoria's Task Force 1000, um, and that was an inquiry that was established in 2014 by the Secretary of the Department of Health and Human Services and the Commissioner for Aboriginal Children and Young People. Um, Victoria has the first Aboriginal Children's Commissioner and you would have heard him speak if you were in any workshops. That would be Andrew Jackamoss. What an amazing yorta yorta man from Victoria. And, I w <laughs> yep. and I've been so disappointed to hear that he's not serving another term. How am I going to survive in a room without him challenging me all the time or without being able to challenge him? Having a commissioner makes sure that we keep t on focus. Having a commissioner is, an Aboriginal children's commissioner is so necessary in every state and territory. They are so important for children because they keep not only the government accountable, but also the Aboriginal service system. Um, Task Force 1000 examined the circumstances at that time of 980 Aboriginal children in care. 
By the time the inquiry re reported in 2016, the numbers of Aboriginal children in care in Victoria had gone up by an even further staggering 59%. <clears throat> Commissioner Jack Moss found that the known risk factors for Aboriginal children in care were, not surprisingly, family violence, drug and alcohol, substance abuse, family, parental mental health, sexual, physical and sexual abuse, as well as the child's risk-taking behaviour and school attendance. He said the following. The genograms of the children painted a picture of the impact of invasion and colonisation of intergenerational disengagement and disempowerment. They were critical in understanding how past policies have impacted on Koori children, their families and community day, today. Through the genograms, we saw generations of connection, connection with the criminal justice system and child protection systems. Stories of unemployment, poverty, poor education, high rates of suicide, and the overriding impact of the past impacting on the present. Andrew was devastated. It was very hard and very emotional doing that, hearing the stories. And you're going to hear very shortly from Professor Helen Milroy. But hearing the stories and the distress, it's like those inquiries have a tax impact on the people that do them. And I know that Andrew suffered very much after doing that inquiry. Since Task Force 1000, two reports, um, two reports have been presented to government, one on the findings of Task Force 1000 inquiry and the other on the Commissioner's finding on an omission inquiry that he held himself into the compliance with the full intent of the Aboriginal Child Placement Principle, and they can be found on his website. <clears throat> and again, many of you will be saying, so you fellas are doing so deadly, you've got all those services, you've got all those resources, and you've got all those inquiries, why still aren't you doing better? Well, to me, I think the biggest challenge is in addressing the systemic and structural issues. These draw our children into the system and then tend to keep them there. We also know from, this, from our practice, we have children in our care who are sixth generation in care, linking back to the stolen generation. This reminds us that Australia's story, including the legacy of the stolen generations and the devastating long, lifelong and intergenerational impacts documented in the Bringing Them Home report, are ongoing and present today. The legacy policy and programs that are based on Western concepts and constructs of child welfare. We have child protection systems that respond to reports of abuse too easily by removing children. We have systems of care that retains Aboriginal children rather than reunifying them. We have systems that tend to work with individuals rather than families or extended families and know little of the context of our families and what they live within. We experience institutional and systemic racism. We have Western child welfare practice frameworks that don't understand or don't talk or don't work with Aboriginal families. And there's a lack of understanding of the value of the Aboriginal workforce in meeting the demands of self-determination. All of these things we are working on. In the remainder of the presentation, I want to try and address these issues. How do we swim against the tide and, and succeed? We have yet to adequately address the legacy of the removalist and, removal and, and assimilationist genocidal policies of the past. We are still seeing multiple generational trauma affecting our families. Poverty is inextricably linked to the difficulties our families experience in being able to provide safe homes for our children. We need to ensure that there is a universal access to universal and specialist services for our people and their children who have a complex and multiple problems. We need to change a system that is institutionally racist and archaic, being based on a Victoria era value, values a system that is under-resourced while at the same time prone towards supporting institutions and systems that are inexpensive and accelerate and enhance the prospects of children becoming institutionalised and leading to criminalisation. We also need, we also, um, we need also to continue to build our communities and strengthen them by empowering them to tackle their problems themselves, by reducing the dependence so that they can reassert their Indigenous status as they see fit. We need to work with our children who are in the system. It, not enough is being done to ensure that they remain connected to their people. They don't have enough support services to address their issues. 
Our families need to have the support they need before they get to the point where their children are being removed. And if children are removed, we need to work earlier to get those children back home. Our response has to be urgent and one that is prepared to stay the course because problems that have taken generations to form will not be sorted overnight. We know that it will have a financial cost and it will need a cohesive approach between Aboriginal people, our services, government and non-government agencies based on our rights to self-determination. We also need mainstream services to commit to hand back resources to Aboriginal people. But we need to stay firm in our commitment to ourselves to do better. So for the last part of my pre presentation, I do really want to start focusing and I do want to talk about self-determination. We've heard a lot about it. We've all been talking about self-determination. Over the years, we've argued for change in legislation and policy based on the principle of our right to self-determination. We argued for the formation of our own health, housing, legal, education and children's services, invoking the right of self-determination. What happens then about the rights of the individual adult, child or young person in this framework of self-determination? Does self-determination end with our organisation? So if you give me money, I'm an, we're an Aboriginal organisation, you give me money, is that self-determination? Is that truly self-determination? Given that it is a collective right, it may seem that way. However, the empowerment that the right implies must be based on an empowered individual who is part of our collective. We would argue that having better legislation and policy helps, and we have seen improvements over the years. However, given the demographic profile of our people, the disadvantaged, the young, the incarcerated, or subject to state intervention in their lives, many of our people are in a constant state of disempowerment. We often challenge mainstream organisations because they do for us. We have become, though, um, you know, and, and have we become the doofers, people doing for us? We have to ask ourselves also, how are we becoming doofers for our people? Are we actually promoting ourselves self-determination in our practice? We have to ask ourselves, how will our practice with our Aboriginal children promote self-determination in our work? <coughs> Sorry. Um, self-determination is also about having Aboriginal, inappropriate Aboriginal governance structures that allows individuals to make real choices and real decisions that affect their own life. For children, it's about knowing who you are and what you want and going about getting it. For our children and young people to feel a self-determination, it is not only about imparting the skills and beliefs onto the child or young person, but it, by including self-determination in the social and societal context in which they live. Our Aboriginal children need to shape their chosen outcomes. They need to be able to make choices and they need to be able to express preferences across their daily lives and delineate their goals specific to the improvement of Aboriginal children's self-determination. As Aboriginal services, we need to define the construct of self-determination into effective practices. We need to assist our children and our families realise self-determination in their interaction with our services. They should be able to exercise these, these rights and become aware of them. Do we speak to our people about what self-determination is like? If we are to support the development of our children and our families, especially those who come into us to be fully functioning, participating, and particularly for our children to become um, participating Aboriginal adults, then we need to make sure we do the things necessary for their development into that fully functioning, participating Aboriginal adult that is culturally aware and connected to their people. This work begins when they are born. For Aboriginal children, we identify the above as things that must, we must consider, particularly for our children. I want to highlight some of our experience in Victoria. Um, it's always a good time to talk about Victoria. Um, we've got conversations about treaty. We're doing lots of things in Victoria. Um, I also love our Premier because he barracks for Essendon, um, but that's beside him. Essendon's out of the competition, so a bit of a no deal at the moment. Um, but um, I, I really want to um, highlight our experience in Victoria. Um, it is also consistent with um, 
conversations around self-determination. Um, the Bringing Them Home had the term self-determination liberally scattered throughout its recommendations. We know through um, experience that words are not enough and that converting them into action and outcomes are also part of the process that lead change. As advocates, as people with a voice, we need to take this challenge up to government. I must re remember seeing our American visitor here. Terry Cross came to our conference a couple of, year, um, a couple of conferences ago. And one of the things he was amazed, Mel Bruff got up and made a speech. He was, at the time, the um, Commonwealth Minister for Aboriginal Affairs. When he got off, Terry Cross said to me, why do you Aboriginal people let politicians speak to you like that? And I said, what do you mean? He said he was so patronising. And we have to ask the question, are we a people that are being patronised? Are we taking our, literally, ab taking our advocacy skills to the highest? Are we actually best taking to government the voice of Aboriginal people? And I think it's time that our voice is heard. In Victoria, our current experience shows that the political process over which we have limited, limited control is an important domain for us to be active. The state government now recognises our right to self-determination and is beginning to base their policy and programs on this principle. Policy, however, needs processes for the application of policy on our own terms. We are currently engaged in discussions around the process towards developing a treaty with government. We are also working on applying the principle of self-determination to other policy and practice areas. In the Aboriginal children's space, we, we have the Aboriginal Children's Forum and is co-chaired by the Aboriginal Community Sector and the Minister. The Minister sits in, a, in the room with us for a full day and hears and listens to Aboriginal people. We have Aboriginal guardianship, so the transfer of guardianship to Aboriginal people. In November, 35 children will be transferred across to the Aboriginal to VACA, um, with the process being rolled out and trialled across the rest of the state. We are also transitioning all Aboriginal children in Victoria back to the Aboriginal community. We currently, 30% have already been transitioned back with, the, 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 with plans to transition over the next two years. We have funding, um, a new funding policy from the department, which is all funding for Aboriginal must go to Aboriginal organisations. There are now funding um, cultural components of child protection, cultural support planning, return to country, we're now changing the way that residential care, we're developing into cultural care. We're developing Aboriginal child welfare models of service, Aboriginal family decision making, kinship care. We're changing the way that we do child welfare. We know, however, with all of these in place, we still need to be engaged internally vision. But most importantly, we need to deliver. 20 years ago, I worked away from the second child um, survival seminar with great hopes and expectations for the future given the Bringing Them Home report's finding and recommendations. Even though they have failed us, governments will always play an important role in the solutions we need, but only in facilitating and supporting the directions we set. We as Aboriginal organisations must in, ter in turn continue to press ahead in our efforts to find better ways to help our children and families regarding of the willingness of the governments to support us. We need to create a new reality on the ground with models of service delivery and, and support for our people supported through their, co their quarter that we can find. We also need mainstream organisations to commit and support us on our journey. FACA's progress over the years has been driven by our motivation to do the best for our children, which for Aboriginal children, like any other children, is to remain and to help them to stay within their families, their community, within their culture. Families are where children learn without being taught, where intangible cultural heritage or the way we do things is passed down. It is a space between which resilience and character is built, where culture and heritage is passed down. I think I've missed one. Um, that's my grandson, by the way. He's beautiful. Um, However, we know that some families can be dangerous places for children and they need to be removed to places of safety. It should not follow, however, that they then forfeit all that they had if they cannot remain with their families and community. Temporary places of safety can become permanent and we need to be conscious of the passing of time and impact this has on our children and on those of, with their innocence. 
Therefore, our approach to working with our children should never be one where we leave this to, to later. Our approach from the start should be that these children in their developmental years are our community members whose future has been entrusted to us. In an environment where it is easy to let standards slip because of some contingency or other need, but we need to be more vigilant than ever. We have a duty of care as Aboriginal people that not only are our, that our children are not only safe, but they grow up into Aboriginal adults, into Aboriginal people, and that they take their places alongside us in the future as a community. No child should ever be forgotten. After 40 years of serving our community, we at VACA are more aware now that we have never, than we have ever been. I urge you to do the same and wish you all the very best in the work you do with our children. I thank you for your, this amazing conference and I have been honoured to hear your work, of your work and thank you for sharing your stories. My hope is that the culture of our people lives for generations and that our children be proud of what we have done today and what you have contributed. Thank you very much.